Lee. So please play, take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, back to that portion of text that we read just a few moments ago. In Exodus chapter 15, we're looking at verses 22 through 27, bitter waters and sweet, Naomi in the desert, part number three. So quick overview, because it's been several weeks since we were here. Two weeks ago was Reverend Coleman, our great high priest. I'd actually planned to be back on that Sunday to preach this message, but as you know, I got stuck in Texas uh, because Hurricane Harvey hit while I was down there. Houston was wiped out. The refineries were wiped out. Everybody went into a panic. Every gas station was out of gas. I couldn't get gas until Saturday. And uh, Saturday afternoon, I sat in line in the Texas heat for three hours before I got to the pump. The station had 10 pumps, but they only had one operating. All of the regular was sold out. All the mid-grade was sold out. The only thing they had left was premium at $3 a gallon. So I filled it up. <laughs> but I figured it doesn't pay to try to leave today. So I stayed for church with my sister on Sunday, waited till Labor Day weekend got over, which was Monday, and then started driving very early in the morning on Tuesday. My son Elijah uh, was keeping tabs for me because uh, the piano that I had picked up at my mother's house, which is a baby grand piano, about the size of that one, they're a little bit larger, uh, had to get out of the house uh, because my sister's trying to sell the house since my mom died and my mother had willed me that piano in her will. That's the reason I'd gone down to Texas. So uh, I had the piano in the trailer and uh, I had most of my dad's library in the van and some of it in the trailer. About a hundred boxes, 40 pounds a piece, about 4,000 pounds of boxes of books. I had planned to drive straight to Pensacola to deliver the trailer because Interstate 10 runs directly east-west from San Antonio through Houston to Pensacola, but Houston was wiped out. Uh, totally flooded, many bridges out, totally impassable, and no gas. So instead, I drove 250 miles north on I-35 to Dallas. Even Dallas was very badly affected by the hurricane, no gas in Dallas. But my son Elijah has an app called GasBuddy.com, and he kept following it for me to tell me which exits there was gas, and which stations they were, and how much it was. So uh, I was able to get gas in Waco, which is south of Dallas. That got me all the way around Dallas to Interstate 20 and headed east uh, across Interstate 20. And then I found gas one more time in Texas. Every other gas station was closed along I-20. I found gas one more time, filled it up, and then began to travel, and I drove straight through the night, resting only for an hour or two at each rest area. And then uh, I was able to get gas with difficulty in Louisiana. It was easier in Mississippi. And then finally, early in the morning, I drove into Alabama and was able to get gas in Tuscaloosa, uh, for which I'm very thankful. Alabama had no gas shortage. Drove all the way to Birmingham, Drove from Birmingham down to Wilsonville and unloaded my father's boxes, 4,000 pounds of books, uh, into my house in Wilsonville. Got back on the road, drove all the way down to Elijah's, and uh, stayed with him overnight. The following night, we, uh, Elijah and my son Sebastian, Anatoly unfortunately was not available. He's the one that's the muscle man, but he had to work that night. Uh, we unloaded the piano. I built a a thing called a piano board so that you can roll the piano without hurting the lip which sticks out off the side. You have to carry it on its edge. We managed to roll it up his driveway very steep, uh, lift it up a couple of steps, uh, rolling it each time, and then finally into his house. That's where the accident occurred. It wasn't because of the piano. I was not looking. I was looking on the left side as we went through the door, and on the right side was a very heavy duty, sharp pointed end table that hit me right at the knee. We managed to get it into his living room, put the legs back on it, stand it up, crawled underneath it and put the pedal pedals on it, and then stayed overnight again. My legs started to hurt, but I didn't think much of it. Then the um, <clears throat> next day I got up very early before even the family got up, 
got in the van, started driving north again on I-65 to head up toward Anastasia's place in Knoxville. The traffic was horrendous. Didn't have any problem with gas, but everybody was fleeing Hurricane Irma, which was coming in at that point. So when I got up to Tennessee, at one of the interstate interchanges, uh, we actually sat at that interchange for more than an hour idling because we couldn't get there. Every, there were no Tennessee cars around me. They were all Florida cars. And uh, finally got to Anastasia's house about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And she looked at my leg and she said, we're going to urgent care. So she took me down to urgent care because she was afraid that it, either there was a, a small hairline fracture or a blood clot. We went uh, in, they took the x-rays. It was incredibly painful at this point. Uh, they wrapped it with an ace bandage, but they said there's no fractures. So the next morning, <clears throat> I got up early and headed back here to New Jersey. I got in 9.30 Saturday night and uh, then had to preach the next Sunday, which was last Sunday, Patriots Day Sunday. And uh, <laughs> so I was uh, really hurting by that point. So Anastasia, I kept texting back and forth and telling her the progress of it and taking Tylenol and taking ibuprofen and wrapping it tightly. Uh, but she finally said, you need to go to the hospital. And so uh, I spent all day Thursday over at Jefferson Hospital. They did another set of x-rays, praise the Lord, no fractures. Then they did some ultrasounds and no um, blood clots, for which I was very thankful, though I have a great, a huge amount of uh, liquid under the knee. The kneecap is fine. It's right above the shin, right under the knee, and um, putting a lot of pressure on my leg and causing a lot of swelling. They gave me a prescription. They got me out of there about 8.30 at night. And um, anyway, so I have to keep my leg elevated, which I'm not doing, obviously, at the moment. Uh, and take the medication every six hours. And uh, oh, the other thing they said you don't have, um, there was one other life threatening possibility, which is some compartmentalization uh, of the uh, muscle, uh, which would destroy the muscle, make it work against itself, and break it down. But uh, they instead concluded that what it was was a, a serious infection, and so they gave me an antibiotic for that infection. So I'm thankful for that, and I thank you all for your prayers, and by the grace of God, I'm able to at least stand up here. I couldn't have stood up here a couple of days ago. Um, it hurt so bad. But anyway, so now, that's over. You don't need to ask any more questions. I've told you everything I know. I'm not a doctor. But I do have another appointment tomorrow to go back in and have it checked. All right, so we're over there in Exodus chapter 15. Uh, what we have covered two weeks ago, because... The third was Reverend Coleman's, the tenth was Patriot Day Sunday, so now we're back to uh, Exodus chapter 15. We've covered the six claims that revealed Pharaoh's heart. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil, my lust shall be satisfied upon them, I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. We saw that those were the six steps of pagan conquest, chase, capture, divide, booty, rape, prepare to execute, and murder. The petty boasts are followed by, uh, of Pharaoh's are followed by the acts of God that completely stopped all six steps of the pagan conquest. The acts of God in the Bible always declare four things. One, what God did. Number two, the results accomplished. Three, the intended purposes of God. And four, praise for his acts. Verses 10 and 11 gave a summary of that praise, uh, how God responded to Pharaoh's intent. Then we covered a big claim by the charismatics because, of course, uh, that problem is always uh, there with the prophetess business. Oh, excuse me, I missed a section here. Uh, the summary is followed by two basic acts of God which are always revealed in all of human history. The first act is his judgment. The second act is his mercy. Then we saw another twofold division, the results and the purposes. We saw the poetic parallelism of that, uh, which takes us back to that long study we had on music. We saw judgment followed by mercy, fear followed by blessing. Mercy is followed by the intended and accomplished results of the acts of God. The results of the acts of God are followed by his intended and accomplished purposes for the acts of God. Then the song had a three-part ending, just like it had a three-part beginning, a conclusion, a summary, and response. And the conclusion was, the Lord shall reign forever 
and ever. That was followed by the fivefold response of God's people, their actions, their words, their music, their praise, and their worship. And that's what brought us to the issue of the prophetess in verse 20, Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron took a timbrel in her hands and all the women went out after her with timbrels and dances. Now that's one of the claims of the charismatics that we still have prophetesses today. We looked at all the prophetesses that are listed in the Old Testament. Miriam the prophetess, Deborah the prophetess, Holder the prophetess, uh, prophetess Noadiah, and Isaiah says, I went in unto the prophetess, and she conceived, so it was obviously Isaiah's wife. In the New Testament, for the day of Pentecost, only one woman is called a prophetess. That was, there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. The New Testament on the day of Pentecost, Peter quotes Joel 2 concerning females prophesying in the last days. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall see dream dreams. We're told in the New Testament also that the daughters of Philip prophesied. He had four virgin daughters who prophesied. And so the only woman in the New Testament who's actually uh, after the day of Pentecost that's called a prophetess is Jezebel in the book of Revelation, and she was obviously a false prophetess. Um, so some people have argued that Paul implied that women prophesied in the church in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 5. So we read the entire context of verses 5 through 15. The Charismatics grab verse 5, but they ignore what the rest of the passage says. Uh, it's not telling you that you need to find female prophetesses in the church. The point of the passage is, number one, the woman was supposed to have two things. Number one, she's supposed to have long hair, and number two, she's supposed to have a head covering, that is a hat, bonnet, scarf, mantilla, or something like that. That's followed by another twofold division, which gives the reasons as to why she should have long hair and as to why she should have a head covering. And the reasons are not cultural. When I was in college, all the students liked to argue that those were cultural reasons. But Paul gives the two reasons. Number one, the order of creation. That's not cultural. And number two, the presence of angels viewing the assembly of the church. That is also not cultural. We noted that we're actually teaching angels both by our doctrine and also our practice, 1 Peter 1.12. Because of those two reasons, physical creation and angelic observers, that's why there are two coverings, a natural covering, the long hair, and a theological covering, the head covering. Paul is clearly not exhorting the church to go out and get female providence leaders because they're not allowed to teach men in the assembly. And we went over 1 Timothy chapter uh, 2 verses 8 through 15, which specifically says that the woman learn in all silence with subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Again, it should be noted that Paul appeals to creation, which is not a cultural issue, because he says, for Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. In case 1 Timothy is not enough to silence women in the church, 1 Corinthians 14, 33 through 38 makes it very clear. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace in all the churches. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience as also saith the law. And he makes two very blunt comments at the end of that passage. If any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments, not the suggestions, they are the commandments of the Lord, that blunt. And then verse 38 is also very blunt. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. So how do you reconcile the commands with what appears to be the activity of certain women uh, in the Bible? First, God never gives the spiritual gifts that are contrary to the clear commands of Scripture. There are three things that, the, that are, give us a solution to this problem. Number one, it appears from what Isaiah 8.3 says that the wife of a prophet was called a prophetess. That covers some instances. Solution number two, the term prophetess and prophecy are clearly used to refer to the singing of women, as in the passage in Exodus 15, because the words are clearly called the song of Moses, both in Exodus 15 and Revelation 15. Miriam did not make up the words, but Miriam and the women did sing. The term to prophesy is clearly used of singing in scripture, set to music in poetic form, and we see the entire New Testament church, including women, doing this with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, which we studied in detail for 16 weeks. 
Solution number three, there's a third possibility as well. The term was apparently used for any wise woman who gave counsel based on revealed truth, but not one who received new special revelation. Deborah and Huldah the prophetess fit into that category. We saw that <clears throat> prophesying is a term that is used of men also who are singing in 1 Chronicles 25, 1 through 7, where it talks about the, the sons of Jeduthun and Heman who should prophesy with harps and psalteries and cymbals. And it was on command, which says, which have prophesied according to the order of the king. Over in uh, 2 Chronicles 25, 3 of Jeduthun, the sons of Jeduthun prophesied with a harp to give thanks and praise to the Lord. Down in verse 5 it says, in the words of God to lift up the horn. Uh, all these were the, under the hands of their father for song in the house of the Lord with cymbals and psalteries and harps. I mean, that is the way in which that term prophecy is used, where you take the inspired words of scripture and set them to music and sing them. And so that, of course, gave us uh, an outline. We added a few things from, uh, from that last time. I won't go over all of that. Um, but the first thing that we notice in overviewing the passage as they come and they find no water and then they go into a panic is one of the most important principles of God in his plan for divine training and discipline of his people is no pain, no gain. And so I, I thanked God when I got this pain in my leg. I said, thank you, Lord. I don't know what you're trying to teach me other than that I am way too weak to do the things that I think I want to do. I have to rely on you because I simply physically can't do what I wanted to do. Now, it was a long trip. It was over 4,000 miles. But uh, by the grace of God, I made it back here. And uh, by the grace of God, I stand here. But it's with the realization, the pain, I hope, has taught me a lesson. It is, I can't do it by myself. I like to sort of set out and I set goals and I try to reach the goals and I put everything I can into it and press forward. But sometimes God says, I'm not going to let you do it. And I've discovered that here once again. <laughs> It's a lesson that I've had to learn many times in life, but um, the pain has to come first, and then we begin to grow. Pain first for focus, cleansing, and growth, and we saw that Mara, bitter water made sweet before Elim, the sweet water from the beginning. <clears throat> we saw the wilderness before Canaan, 40 years of wandering before 40 years of conquest. We saw the cross before the crown, that's very clear from the example of Christ. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, that's a very important word, wherefore, because he humbled himself, because he suffered first, because he went through the pain first, because he went down before trying to go up, wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You've heard me say it many times. you heard me say it many times more. The way up is down. The way up is down. It's like a siphon. You have to go down before you can come up. We saw worse before better in John 2.10, the water made wine. We saw suffering before glory in Luke chapter 24, verses 25 and following those on the road to Emmaus. He said, O fools and slow of heart to believe all of the prophets have said, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. And he started at Moses and all the prophets and expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. We often think we're going through unbearable suffering right now, but God has designed it for our good. And I'm preaching this to me this morning, as well as to all of you, and for his glory, because it's burning the trash out of my life and your life and conforming us to the image of Christ. And we know that all things work together for good, to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. That's in the same context as suffering before glory. Verse 17 says, And if children, then heirs, and heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed 
in us. So we need to quit complaining how much we hurt, and we need to move forward and use the experience to conform to the image of Christ. Now that brings us to new material for today. Let me give you another illustration of suffering before glory in the New Testament. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Dead before life, suffering before reigning. How about another illustration of suffering before glory? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet our inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Outward man is perishing, but then it's being renewed. Our affliction, Paul says, is a light affliction. He suffered a lot more than this. I mean, it's astounding he even lived through it. Our light affliction. He said, remember, it's very temporary. It's only for a moment. But it works for us a far more exceeding weight of glory. Affliction before glory. It's a principle that most of us don't like. I certainly don't feel very good about it, but I know that it's true. So I want to learn from whatever it is that God puts me through. I hope you do too. Maybe you're saying, well, that's a few illustrations, but there probably aren't any more. Really? Okay, let me give you another illustration of suffering before glory. In fact, this is one of God's key training principles all over the scripture, and it is clearly indicated in our text, Exodus 15, this morning. Yes, I haven't lost track of the fact that I'm, <laughs> we're studying Exodus. But Exodus is God's exposition of the principle of suffering before glory through an entire book of the Bible. That's what Exodus is all about, is suffering before glory. We start off with Exodus with suffering. And we find more suffering, and we find more suffering, and we find plagues. We find deliverance, but then we find suffering in 40 years in the wilderness, and suffering, and suffering, and suffering. Before we finally get to the book of Joshua, and we cross over into victory and conquest and glory. Exodus is the principal book of the Old Testament that God uses to teach the principle of suffering before glory. Listen to what James says about this principle. James 1.12 Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, that is, put to the test, endures the pressures, endures all the things that batter in on him day by day, the things that the righteous soul can hardly stand to bear. They come in and come in and come in and they attack 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 and the attacks never seem to cease. For when he is tried, when he is put to that test, what comes next? He shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. You suffer not for your own stupidity, not for your own sin, but because of your love for Christ. And if you bear it patiently, if you push through the tests and the temptations and the trials, you have something waiting for you at the finish line. Many, 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 many years ago when I was an athlete, that's why I was willing to go through the pain and the agony and the suffering. Because there was a small ribbon with a gold medal attached to it that would be handed to me on the award stand before the whole congregation, the whole crowd.
You've seen it at the Olympics. Suffering before glory. How about the book of Revelation? Revelation 2.10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Suffering before glory. Folks, it's coming to the United States. You may not understand it now, but I've been getting various emails from Christian legal organizations all over the United States expressing that exact thing, persecution, is coming to the church in America. They're doing their best to fight it, but they are not winning all of their battles. You need to be prepared. It's coming. The list goes on. 1 Peter 1.11 Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which is in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Chapter 4 Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Now here's where you don't suffer for your own stupidity. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come, the judgment must begin. Who can quote me the next four verses? The next four words? Judgment must begin at the house, five words, of God. I hope that rattled you in your little booties. The time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Verse 19, capstone verse of this passage, it brings us to our theme. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God Commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. You don't say, well, that's what they're doing to me, so I'll do them dirty. They did me bad, I'll do them even worse. They beat me up, I'll fix them. No, instead you respond by doing well, the right thing. How about 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and following? Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. You have an enemy, folks. Whom resist steadfast in the faith. Don't compromise. Don't go to try to hide. He wants you to run away. The Bible says, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions. Did you know the devil doesn't just attack in the spirit realm? Do you remember the book of Job? The incredible physical phenomenon that he was capable of creating to destroy all that Job had? But he left him one thing. He left him a nagging wife 
who told him to curse God and die. She was Satan's tool. Whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. And most of us will never suffer anywhere near as much as what our brothers and sisters in Christ are currently suffering all over the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, now listen to the next phrase. Say, Peter, why don't you get off that subject? Hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. Here's the phrase. After that ye have suffered a while. Suffering precedes glory. After that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. If you respond properly to suffering, that's what it will do. It will make you mature. Perfect is the word that's here in English, but that's the word teleos. It means to make mature, complete. Suffering makes you complete. Suffering, if it is responded to properly, will establish you. Suffering, if you respond to it properly, will strengthen you. Suffering, if you respond to it properly, will settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Hebrews 12, you know this verse. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. We can suffer at the hands of the world. We can suffer at the hands of God. In either case, God use it to conform us to the image of Christ. Let me give you a few more. Psalm 126.6. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Weeping first, harvest second. Psalm 66.10. For thou, Lord God, hast proved us. Thou hast tried us as silver is tried. Thou broughtest us into the net. Thou latest affliction upon our loins. Thou hast caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but thou broughtest us out into a wealthy place. So I will go into the house, thy house, with burnt offerings. I will pay thee my vows. It was God that brought him into the net. It was God that laid affliction on his loins. It was God that caused men to ride over his head. He went through the fire and through the water by the hand of God. But thou broughtest us out into a wealthy place. Suffering first, blessing second. I will go to thy house with burnt offerings. I will pay thee my vows. Do you do that when you come through the times of suffering? Is that how you respond as David did here in this song? How about John 12, 24? Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Suffering first, blessing second. Suffering first, blessing second. Matthew 5, 4. Blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. Sorrow first, comfort second. Sorrow first, comfort. Do you understand this principle? This is all over the Bible. John 16, 20. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. Sorrow first, joy second. Sorrow first, joy second. It's all over the Bible. 
The second thing that we notice here in this passage is that the people murmured. By the way, this is the very first time that their murmuring is recorded after they left Egypt. They'd only been three days on the road when they began to gripe and complain. Most of us can't bear inconveniences very long before we start to complain either. The Bible says that God put Israel to the test and Israel put God to the test. God gave them opportunities to respond properly and trust him, but they chose not to trust him. They chose to complain. Did you know that there is a limit? A set limit, a number of times that God will allow you to complain before he destroys you? Israel murmured against God ten times. And then God said, that's enough. You're all going to die. Let me read it to you. Numbers chapter 14, verse 22. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice. And he goes on and says, I'm going to kill them all. The ten times of rebellion brought Israel to the point of no return. Remember, although God is long-suffering, there does come a point of no return where he sends his hand of destruction and takes the bad football player off the field. They saw the ten plagues from God. They tempted God ten times, one for each plague that should have caused both faith and fear of the Lord not to complain. Now, I don't know who all has put together these, but I've not found this very, very often. Where were the ten times that Israel complained? Murmured against the Lord. Have you ever wondered, hey, I wonder what those ten times were, and you looked at your footnotes and they weren't there. Because most Bibles don't have a footnote that tells you where were the ten times. You look in the commentaries. Most of the commentaries don't have any kinds of footnotes that tell you where the ten times were. So if you're taking notes, here's a good thing to write down. I'm going to give you the ten times that Israel complained against God and why God finally said to them, because you've complained ten times now, I'm going to snuff you out. You is toast. Number one, we have it in chapter 14 here in Exodus. Verses 11, 10 through 12. Exodus 14, 10 through 12. That the Red Sea is number one. When Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were so afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord, and they said unto Moses, now here's their belly aching, because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. You know what they were going to get to do? They were going to get to die in the wilderness. Not here. They griped against Moses, and we find out later that when they griped against Moses, they were actually griping against God. Moses says, You haven't griped against me, you've griped against the Lord. Because what am I? I'm no big deal. But God put me to lead, and I've led you the way God said to lead you. And so when you gripe against me, you're griping against God. Here is number one. Exodus 14, 10 through 12. The second time, that's our text. Exodus 15, verses 22 through 24. At Marah. If you're putting names to this, number one is at the Red Sea. Number two is at Mara. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness, and they found no water. 
And when they came to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Mara. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? There's the murmuring, there's the complaining, there's the belly aching. Remember, when you belly ache against an intermediary authority, you are belly aching against the highest authority. God says so. That was number two. I'll give you one more and then our time is up. Wilderness of sin. Exodus chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. The wilderness of sin. And they took their journey from Elim, which is where they're camped right now. Of course, they got the, the good water there in the 70 palm trees. They took their journey from Elim, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, where we sat by the flesh pots. <laughs> flesh pots. The flesh pots of Egypt. Doesn't it sound succulent? And when we did eat bread to the full, for he had brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now, how would you like to be two little squat Jewish guys surrounded by a minimum of two million, probably closer to six million, hostile people intent on killing you? I mean, think about it. There was no place for them to run. There was no place to hide. There were no secret tunnels. There were no helicopters to lift them out. The people were ready to kill them. Wilderness of sin. Griping against Moses and Aaron, but if their gripe is really against God, would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots. Well, you know what? They're going to get their opportunity. They're going to die by the hand of the Lord, but not sitting by flesh pots in Egypt. They're going to die in the wilderness. Murmuring and complaining are very great sins in the sight of God. We've got seven more to go, and we won't have time for that today. But murmuring and complaining are very great sins in the sight of God. He kills people for doing it. He gives you just so many opportunities before he says, okay, your time is up, your number is full. You will never do it again you will die. God is long-suffering. God chastens his children. But remember, people, God has also made it clear that there comes a point of no return. You take the last step and it's out off the edge of the cliff into abject nothingness. And you're on your way down and there are no places to stop. It does not pay to gripe. It does not pay to murmur. It does not pay to complain. We need to learn to say thank you to the Lord, even during the difficult times, the many times of suffering and sorrow and reproach and lack. If we learn to respond properly, God says you are learning to walk by faith. You are learning to trust me. You are learning not to gripe about the circumstances of life because God controls all the circumstances of life. And so we can always say, thank you, Father, because you are conforming me to the image of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your marvelous goodness, your righteous ways, your love, your kindness, your faithfulness, and yes, your discipline. We thank you for the times of personal discipline because it shows you love us. Your word says so. We thank you, Father, for the times of difficulty in life, which are merely related to the hardness of living in a sin-cursed world. But you never let anything happen to us, but such as is common to man. But you've promised you are faithful. You always, with every temptation, make a way to escape that we may be able to bear it. Father, we pray for our suffering brothers and sisters in Christ coming up very soon to the Sunday whereby we pray for the persecuted Christians around the world. Father, we thank you that you are God, that you love them as well as you love us. And perhaps soon we will have to go through the things that they are currently suffering so that we might be more perfectly conformed to the image of Christ. Help us to use our time wisely. Help us to know that every day could be our last. Help us not to waste time. Help us not to be frivolous. Help us not to focus on the things of earth. Help us not to be worldly minded and carnal in our passions. But help us to put Jesus Christ at the center of our lives in everything so that we might say with the Apostle Paul, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is number 316, O Sacred Head Now Wounded. Number 316.